Welcome back. Um, let's finish up our talk on tyrosine kinase receptors. Okay, so recall from the last video we had a receptor tyrosine kinase, and recall that we had three critical tyrosine residues on it, right? And on each of these critical tyrosine residues, we had the opposite beta subunit phosphorylated, right? So what we ended up with is we ended up with three critical tyrosine residues, and each of them was phosphorylated, right? Okay, so three critical tyrosine residues. So if we had our setup like this, so if each one of these represents that this is the beta-1 subunit and this is the beta-2 subunit, recall that in one catalysis, the beta-1 acted as the catalytic domain and phosphorylated three tyrosine residues on the beta-2, and in the second case, beta-2 is the catalytically active protein, and it phosphorylated three critical tyrosine residues on beta-1. So they phosphorylate each other, and this process, this process was called autophosphorylation. Autophosphorylation, okay? Sometimes you'll even hear it referred to as cross-phosphorylation. It's the same thing, okay? But the net effect is, let's say this was beta-1, the net effect is we get three critical tyrosine residues on each beta subunit and they get phosphorylated okay now one thing that we really didn't make apparent in the last video is that this activates the tyrosine kinase receptor okay so effectively what it means to be activated for this particular receptor is that things can bind to it okay and we'll get to that in just a minute what's important to understand now is that not only can the receptor tyrosine kinase not only can it phosphorylate its partner beta subunit but it can also do the same things to other intracellular proteins. And now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, the initial biosignaling cascade effect of the um, tyrosine kinase receptor. Okay. So the first thing that's going to that's going to come here and get phosphorylated is going to be a protein called IRS1. Okay. And essentially it's just going to, it's just going to be a protein. So here's going to be IRS. IRS1, and IRS1 just stands for insulin receptor signal 1, okay? It's a protein, and this protein, there's several important things about it. Number one, it's going to get phosphorylated at tyrosine residues, okay? So it's just like um, the actual other beta subunit, right? Okay, so in the case of the beta subunits, those got, phospho those got phosphorylated on tyrosine residues, Insulin receptor signal one can do that as well. So this phosphate, this phosphate right here, it ultimately came from one of the beta subunits. In other words, the phosphate came from the ATP, but the actual catalysis was catalyzed by the beta subunit. Okay, so you get phosphorylated tyrosine residues in IRS1. Okay, now there's something else that's important about IRS1, and it's actually we're actually going to see this in several other proteins here. Okay. Um, the, the, the protein has something called an SH2 domain, okay? And specifically, this area right here that I'm highlighting in orange is going to represent our SH2 domain, okay? SH2. And essentially what SH2 domain means is that it's a component of a particular protein that's specific for binding to phosphotyrosine residues, okay? So if you have a protein that has tyrosine residues and they're phosphorylated, SH2 dom domains of, of other proteins can bind to them, okay? So for instance, what we'll see is there actually, there's actually an SH2 domain that can actually bind here, okay? So I hope that makes sense. So if you have an SH2 domain, it's going to bind to phosphotyrosine residues and other proteins. Okay, so IRS1 has one of those. Okay, and effectively what IRS1 is, it's going to serve as a docking protein. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as adapter proteins, but the 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 the, uh, co the, the um, concept is like this. Okay, so let's say you have, let's say you're in your kitchen and you have a really uh, tall kitchen, and you have on a top shelf of your pantry you have like a, a, a box of cookies or something. Now, you're not tall enough by yourself to reach the box of cookies, right? But you know those things that they advertise on TV, those grabbers, where it's like that long stick with the uh, tongs at the end, and you could push a button on one end and it would like grab things, right, the grabber? You probably know what I'm talking about. So in other words, you did, couldn't directly get in contact with the cookies, but you could indirectly through the means of the grabber. Well, in this case, the grabber is analogous to IRS1. Okay, so what we have to realize is that the, ins the, the, the insulin receptor or the tyrosine kinase receptor in general cannot go into the depths of the cytoplasm and you know affect things there. It has to bring things up to it, to the membrane, because it's confined there, right? So if you were to bind an adapter protein to the tyrosine kinase receptor, 
then things can come to the tyrosine kinase receptor and bind there, okay? Because the tyrosine kinase receptor cannot come into the cytoplasm because it's confined to the membrane. So to get things done deeper inside the cell, you have to sort of branch things off from the membrane where the receptor is, okay? So IRS1 does that, okay? It's effectively, you could sort of consider the intracellular proteins as your box of cookies, and IRS1 is sort of bridging the receptor and those cookies, or in our case, the proteins, okay? So IRS1 is your docking protein protein or your adapter protein, okay? Now, IRS1 is going to bind another protein, and this protein, which also has SH2 domain, this protein is this one, and this protein is called GRB2. This is GRB2. This stands for growth receptor, uh, or excuse me, growth factor receptor bound protein 2, okay? And um, growth factor receptor bound protein 2 also has an SH2 domain. You notice here, at this point, right, that it's also bound to the phosphotyrosine residue of IRS1. Because remember, IRS1 got phosphorylated by the tyrosine kinase receptor, right? So GRB2 can also bind there as well, okay? Now, what we're going to see in um, GRB2, it also has another domain. And this domain I'm going to do, let's say, let's say I do this in gray, okay? GRB2 has another domain, okay? And this domain is called SH3, okay? Now, to, 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 to distinguish it from SH2, okay, so this is 3, and what SH2, what SH2 does is it binds to the phosphotyrosine residues. SH3 is different. It binds to proline-rich sequences in proteins. So if you have a protein that has a proline-rich sequence, um, it's likely to bind to the SH3 region of proteins. And specifically, there's one particular protein that tends to bind to GRB2, and that's going to be our son of seven list. It's a strange name. Um, so this protein right here is going to be son of seven lists, also called SOS. Okay. SOS is called a well, it's called son of seven lists, uh, but the type of protein it is is a guanosine nucleotide exchange factor. Okay. And if you remember uh, from if you watched the G protein video, we talked a little bit about guanine or well, yeah, guanine nucleotide exchange factors. What they are is they're essentially enzymes that that exchange bound GDP for GTP. So let's say, let's come over here and do an example. Let's say I have a protein. Let's say I have a protein that's inactive and it has bound GDP. So this is your inactive protein, right? Inactive. And effectively what the, what the guanosine nucleotide exchange factor does is, and we'll put NEF nucleotide exchange factor. What it does is it basically causes the release of GDP, okay? And effectively, it binds GTP, okay, and then the protein becomes active, right? So usually, in the case of these proteins, they're acting on G proteins, okay? So normally, remember, G proteins are active when they have bound GTP and inactive when they have bound GDP. So son of seven list, what it's going to do is we'll find is it's going to catalyze the removal of GDP from a G protein and attach GTP, okay? So the the protein that it's going to act on is a protein called RAS. Okay, and you may have heard of RAS before. Okay, RAS is a G protein. So this is RAS. So son of seven less is our nucleotide exchange factor. RAS is our G protein. Okay, G, uh, uh, G um, these RAS proteins, what they effectively are, are they are molecular switches. Okay, and they're usually found somewhere in biosignaling pathways. And they're, what their purpose is is when they get activated. Um, they're effectively um, activating other proteins, usually they're kinases, okay? So what you're going to find is that GDP will leave, right? So now you should have bound GTP attached to RAS, okay? So ultimately when SOS gets activated by binding to, um, by binding to the uh, SH3 domain of GRB2, uh, SOS activates RAS by causing it to bind GTP and then RAS becomes activated. Okay, now when RAS becomes activated, it binds another protein, and this is a kinase, okay? This protein is called RAF1, and sometimes you'll even see it abbreviated C-RAF, okay? C-RAF, basically what RAF is, this is RAF, RAF proto-oncogene, so it's RAF proto-oncogene serine threonine protein kinase, that's the full name, so RAF proto-oncogene serine threonine protein kinase, Okay. And again, this is a kinase. Okay. So when RAS gets activated, 
by um, SOS, by binding GTP, it binds RAF1 and activates RAF1. So what do we see up to this point? Well, if we take a little zoom out, okay, what we're effectively seeing, if we come up here and look at the big picture, is we're seeing what? We're seeing the assembly of a multi-enzyme protein complex, okay? This is really the first case where we're starting to see something like this. This is a very cool thing. So what we're seeing is multiple proteins assembling, and they're ultimately, ultimately going to lead to what's going to be referred to as a mitogen-activating protein kinase cascade. Okay, but ultimately what this multi-enzyme complex is going to do is it's going to activate particular proteins in the pathway of insulin. Now what I want to be perfectly clear about is this, okay, tyrosine kinase receptors are not just found with insulin, they're found with other things like IGF-1, epidermal growth factor, usually growth factors, but what I want to make perfectly clear is that these biosignaling uh, proteins can change depending on on which uh, particular hormone we're talking about, whether it's epidermal growth factor or insulin or whatnot. This pathway has to do with insulin specifically, but just know that these downstream um, second messengers can change, okay? But the point is that we have this multi-enzyme complex to getting together and it's going to activate other proteins, okay? So at this point, let's zoom back, zoom back in and we've just activated RAF1. Now RAF1 is gonna activate, in the case of insulin, a protein called MEK. Okay, so this protein's gonna be MEK, okay? And it turns out that in the phosphorylated state, MEK is active, okay? Now, is it important to really understand how many times it gets phosphorylated? Not really. Just understand that what we're seeing right here is an example of something called a mitogen-activated protein kinase cascade, okay? So the point is that when RAF1 becomes activated, it phosphorylates MEK, okay? Now, again, when you phosphorylate MEK, it becomes active, okay? So now when MEK becomes activated, it's going to act as a kinase as well. And it's going to phosphorylate another protein called MEK. Excuse me, ERK. That was MEK. It phosphorylates ERK, E-R-K, okay? So ERK becomes phosphorylated by MEK, okay? So then we get this. We get ERK, excuse me, it's supposed to be a K. We get ERK with a phosphate, right? That's terribly drawn. You know, let me just go ahead and redo that just so it's a little bit neater. So we get ERK that has a phosphate on it, right? Again, not perfect, but oh well. So ERK becomes activated, okay? Now it turns out that ERK is a, is, when it's phosphorylated, it can actually enter the nucleus. So ERK in the phosphorylated state is going to come into the nucleus, and it's going to phosphorylate um, a protein called ELK1, okay? So here's ELK1, ELK1, and it's going to get phosphorylated by ERK, okay? Now, ELK1 acts as a transcription factor, okay? So when ELK1 is phosphorylated, it dimerizes with another another protein called um, SRF, okay? So if you have SRF here, right, in the non-phosphorylated state, which is this one, it's separate from SRF. But as soon as ELK1 gets phosphorylated, um, ELK1 with the phosphate dimerizes with SRF and you get a complex, okay? And this complex, effectively what it does is it binds to the DNA, okay? So this whole complex right here is going to bind to the DNA, and then, of course, you're going to get mRNA, right? It's going to do transcription, right? You get mRNA, that exits here, and then you get a protein, okay? So, again, the ELK1 and SRF, those are transcription factors. They dimerize, and they bind to the DNA at specific segments and induce uh, transcription of certain genes, and then ultimately that leads to a protein eventually, okay? So what have we seen with this, this insulin cascade? Well, what we've seen is that we, first of all, assemble a fairly large protein complex that ultimately serves to activate a kinase cascade. Specifically, the kinase, kinase cascade here is termed a, um, a mitogen-activated protein kinase cascade. Now, why is it called mitogen-activated? Uh, the reason is because generally things that bind to tyrosine kinase receptors are mitogens. What's a mitogen? Well, mitosis is cell division. Okay, so generally things that um, induce cell division, proliferation, things like that, those are generally termed mitogens for that region because they induce mitosis. 
So generally, because these, typic, these pathways typically activate mitosis, the things that bind to the receptor are termed mitogens, and so the cascade proteins are called mitogen-activating protein kinases, okay? So that's just some terminology for you. So let's do a little recap. So recall that beta-1 phosphorylated three critical tyrosine residues on beta-2, and beta-2 did the same thing to beta-1, right? So we have three critical phosphotyrosine residues on each beta subunit, and it turns out that you can that IRS1, which is insulin receptor signal 1, can specifically bind to those phosphotyrosine residues at its SH2 domain. And one important thing that comes out of this is the SH2 domain is a protein um, a sequence that specifically targets phosphotyrosine residues. Okay, so IRS1 has that, but it itself gets phosphorylated by the tyrosine kinase receptor, right? So it gets phosphorylated here. That's what this is supposed to be. Okay. And then it binds GRB2. Now, the GRB2 protein, which is growth factor receptor bound protein 2, also has um, an SH2 domain, right? And that binds to the tyrosine, uh, the phosphotyrosine on IRS1. But the GRB2 also has an SH3 domain. And recall, SH3 was a domain on a protein that specifically targets uh, proline rich sequences and proteins. And it turns out that Son of Sevenless has a. Um, a, a proline rich sequence and that would that's what binds to grb2 now don't ask me don't ask me why it's called son of sevenless i don't know it's a strange name just refer to it as sos but know that it stands for son of sevenless and that protein is a guanosine nucleotide exchange factor so ras in its inactive state has bound gdp right and so sos catalyzes the removal of gdp and its displacement with gtp on ras which activates ras right and ras is a is a binary um, molecular on-off switch, and when it's when RAS gets activated, it binds RAF1 and activates RAF1, right? And RAF1, the full name for it is um, is RAF proto-oncogene serine threonine protein kinase. Okay, so that's RAF1, um, also called CRAF, which basically phosphorylates MEK, which is which is what starts the mitogen-activating protein kinase cascade, right? Phosphorylated MEK is activated, and it phosphorylates ERK. So you can think of this ERK as the active one, right? ERK gets phosphorylated and enters the nucleus, and it phosphorylates ELK1, which is a transcription factor, but ELK1 is only active when it's phosphorylated. And as soon as it gets phosphorylated, it dimerizes with SRF. So you get this, this active uh, complex of transcription factors, which binds to DNA specific sequences and induces... Um, induces transcription and ultimately that leads to the production of the protein okay so what are some key takeaways from this video well understanding that in a lot of biosignaling pathways especially tyrosine kinase receptors you get these um this assembly of this large multi-protein complex and that's what facilitates the actual catalysis and, and transduction from insulin or whatever it is into an intracellular signal okay now, another thing that's also important about this is the concept of mitogen activating protein kinase cascades. Okay? These are also called MAP kinase cascades, and that just has to do with the fact that generally these cascades terminate in a signal that induces mitosis, therefore the original signal like insulin is a mitogen. Okay? Um, also understand the various um, functions of the proteins in the uh, cascade which we've gone over. Um, and another critical thing to understand are SH2 domain, domains and SH3 domains. Those crop up quite a bit. Just remember SH2 binds to phosphotyrosine residues and SH3 is going to bind to proline-rich sequences in proteins. Okay? But generally for insulin, you're just going to follow this pathway and that's how you generate your proteins. Now, what's really critical to understand is that this pathway is not the same for every single mitogen. In other words, other things that bind to tyrosine kinase receptors have different um, biosignaling pathways. For instance, I would bet you, I don't know this for a fact, but I bet you epidermal growth factor has a different pathway, slightly. Um, Insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, has a different one. So, it, so again, the, the actual identity of the biosignaling pathway is dependent on which, um, which mitogen that's actually binding to the receptor. Okay, so I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on what happens after we phosphorylate the tyrosine residues on the receptor tyrosine kinase. See you in the next video.